Hopefully you grabbed the map out there. Um, there's a map, maps on the podium in the foyer of the second missionary journey of Paul. And um, we, we got through a good portion of it last week. Uh, just looking at the map real quick, um, you know, Paul was going through, uh, he started out in Antioch and went from Antioch. And of course, if you don't have a map in your hand, there's probably one in the back of your Bible, at least very likely, and they're all, they're all similar, of course. Um, he started out in Antioch and then went through the northern part of what we would call, what they called Asia, um, and did so and went over to Troas, and Troas is where he had the vision of the Macedonian man. And I realized that the, the Spirit, you know, the Spirit and both the Spirit of Jesus and the Holy Spirit um, prevented him from preaching in Asia. He was technically in Asia when, when it says that, but what really was being referred to as Asia is that part that's further south that is essentially the area that encompasses where the seven churches of Asia of Revelation end up being. Paul does go to Asia for a quick stop on his way back home, on his way back on this second missionary journey. He spends a significant amount of time on the third missionary journey there. So even though he's prevented at this time to go there, he does end up going there later. Crosses over, goes over to... Uh, Neapolis and then Philippi and Philippi is where we left him uh, last week we were in uh, Acts chapter 16 and that's where we're going to take up today we looked at the conversion of Lydia in Acts chapter 16 we noted that in chapter uh, 16 verses um, 6 through 10 that Paul has this vision of a man from Macedonia, and he is called and compelled to come over there, and Paul immediately answers that and goes, because they had not been allowed to preach the gospel in Asia. It's a great example of something that was right and good, but the timing wasn't what God wanted. You know, it was God's will that Paul preach in Asia, but not then. Paul would have some of his best mission work in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus ends up being probably um, the, I guess you could say, one of the, the biggest maybe accomplishments of Paul's preaching time. Paul spends uh, three and a half years in Ephesus teaching in the school of Tyrannus and all of Asia comes to hear him lecture while he's there. That ends up being probably one of the productive things that Paul does in all of his mission work. And it's in this region. Well, it's going to be at a later date in the third missionary journey. So, there's a great lesson for us to learn. Something may be good, it may be right, it may be absolutely what God wants us to do, He just doesn't want us to do it today. And that's where Paul was. It was a later time. That doesn't mean we procrastinate. It just realizes that sometimes the timing is not exactly what it needs to be. Maybe a later date is going to be uh, better. And so uh, Paul was willing to preach and teach wherever God wanted. And they were, he was to go to Macedonia. Macedonia we now call Greece. Uh, that is part of the, the nation that we call Greece today. Um, but it was called Macedonia at the time. And the first city he comes to is Philippi. And at Philippi, Philippi apparently does not have a very large Jewish contingent. In that day and time, if you had ten Jewish men, you were able to have a synagogue. And so there is no mention of Philippi having a synagogue. Paul and all the other cities before and all the other cities later would start out at the synagogue to preach. And so the fact that he doesn't do that is unique in Paul's message. Paul instead goes down to the riverside on the Sabbath day. Paul would normally go to a synagogue at that point, 
but goes down the river. Why? Why did he go down the river? Yeah, people would meet there, and he, he took the assumption, it seems to be, that that would be a place of prayer, that people would, would take that as a place to go and meet on the Sabbath day to pray. And so Paul, in doing that, went out there, and he found some people that wanted to listen. And who all was out there? Primarily a group of women. And one of those being Lydia. And Lydia and her family and some of the other women become the first converts that Paul, uh, that Paul brings to Christ that we have recorded. He could have in, in some of the earlier towns he came to, but it seems like when he went through some of the others, he, he went through them pretty quickly. And so, um, you know, it, it says he went to Samothrace and Neapolis, but it doesn't say anything about converting anybody there. So most likely, these ladies in Philippi were the first ones he converted. I think it's intriguing. mentioned it to you last week. You know, Paul gets a vision of a man from Macedonia says, come over and help us. And the first thing he does is when he gets over there, he converts a, a large group of women. And, you know, I, I think that's just kind of intriguing. I don't know if there's anything to be made out of that. It's just that, you know, they have that image. And also, not only that, but the first woman he converts is not even Macedonian. And you remember where she's from? Where Lydia's from? She's from Asia, specifically the town of Thyatira. Thyatira is one of the seven churches of Asia later on in Revelation. Because she is a seller of purple goods, uh, she is a trader and would, would know the routes and know, have undoubtedly have connections in that area. It may very well be that one of the main reasons why she... Paul wasn't to go down in that area yet is because there needed to be some doors opened. And here is a person, this lady, Lydia, who could have doors opened in that region and could help with that potentially. And so also, we will find out a little later on, Paul ends up meeting a couple of people that become some of his best friends uh, down in Corinth. Uh, in Aquila and Priscilla and at the end of this missionary journey Aquila and Priscilla start off with Paul heading back to Antioch and Paul leaves them in Ephesus and so that's going to be something that plays prominently too so two things going one is Paul needs to make some connections in Asia and number two Paul has people he hasn't met yet that are going to be very important to him personally and in his ministry in Aquila and Priscilla who are going to be able to establish the congregation in Ephesus and, and go from there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely God's providence in that. And, and, that's, and it's God's providence in the timing of it all. You know, and so... You know, yes, it's going to be perfectly valid to get to Ephesus. Some of Paul's greatest work is going to be in Ephesus. But there needs to be some building blocks to take place. Like one needs to go to Macedonia and convert some people. He needs to meet the Aquila and Priscilla who are going to go. And, and they're going to end up being the, the starters of the, the Ephesian church. And you might say the backbone of that congregation for a lot of years to come. And then Paul's going to end up being there eventually and do some great work there. But Aquila and Priscilla are going to be there. And at the very beginning, uh, we're going to find out as we transition to the third missionary journey that a missionary comes through named Apollos. And Apollos, um, he didn't have anything quite right. In particular, on the on baptism and Aquila and Priscilla teach him more correctly and then he goes right back on the preaching and then he ends up going over to Corinth a little later on but Apollos after Aquila and Priscilla 
convert him end up being he ends up being very significant there in Ephesus, and that plays all prominently in there. And as Janet is saying, she's exactly right. It's God's providence working through all these things. You know, God is God is working in the right order, and God knows the right order. Paul doesn't know the right order, and he's just willing to follow along with what God wants. You know. Um, you see that all throughout the New Testament. You see that all throughout the Bible. You know, uh, we saw it earlier on, and in, in when we look at like Philip, Philip was having the great work there in Samaria, and God tells him through an angel, says, "I want you to go down to Gaza." And he goes down there and he meets the Ethiopian eunuch, and he talks with him, converts him, and he takes the gospel back. To Africa, it becomes the first African uh, convert, or at least in, that we have in Ethiopia, and it ends up going back there. So that's uh, pretty significant. What happens there? God, God knows what He's doing in directing all that. Sometimes it's important for us to recognize that God's timing is a little different than what we would like, and in the process of that, uh, we just need to do our part. Sow the seed, do the work we can, and let God deal with the, the details as they come. In verse 16, in following, after Paul has converted Lydia and after Paul is there, uh, Lydia prevails upon them to have Paul and Silas stay with them and the, and the others that are there. Um, you have Paul and Silas. Who else do you have that we know of? Okay, Luke is also there. Um, we know Luke is there. Luke is really on the, on the down low on himself in there in the book. But how we know it is in verse 11. It says, So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and all. Luke concludes himself in the we. Luke almost never says Luke was there. Luke is the author of Acts. But at some place, Luke joined the group. And from then on, he calls says we. And so that's his subtle way of letting you know he's there. So, so Luke is there. Paul and Silas are there. There's one other individual we know for sure is there. Timothy, yes. Timothy is there. Because they they picked up Timothy back in in uh, in Lystra earlier on in the journey, so the four of them are there. They stay with with Lydia and her family. Verse sixteen and following, as they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having been, become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Here is a woman who has a... a a demon, an evil spirit. And this spirit is able to tell fortunes or to tell the future. Well, you think about what a great thing that would be if you were the... She's a slave girl, and so the owners made all kinds of money. People would come and say, you know, you can ask your question, and hey, you pay us money, and they'd become rich off of, off of what she could do. So what happens? With this. This, is very, this is very, very intriguing. Day in and day out, she follows after Paul and Silas. And what does this, this spirit of divination, this, this evil spirit, what does the spirit say? They're men of God. They're, they're servants of the Most High God. Now something you'll notice, almost always through Scripture. Satan and the demons, their favorite term 
for God, the one thing God has that Satan wants is power. That's the one thing that God has that Satan really wants. Satan doesn't want God's holiness. He doesn't want God's goodness. He doesn't want God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and all those things that make God who He is. Satan covets God's power. And so the term that is that that Satan uses or the demons use almost exclusively throughout Scripture always is in reference to the power that God has. They are servants of the Most High God. They recognize the power of God. These men are God's servants of the Most High God. And what is the message? They are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. That is a pretty awesome endorsement, isn't it? Huh? You would think. Here is an evil spirit saying, these guys, these men are servants of the Most High God and they're telling you the way of salvation. Well, that's a good question. We, we don't know entirely the context. And Paul doesn't do this on the first day that he encounters her. That she keeps following him, or at least at the beginning of it. We don't, we don't know how long. It may have been, you know, but it says she kept doing it for many days. So there is multiplicity of days that she keeps saying this. So Paul lets it go again and again and again. But day in and day out, she calls out. And maybe that's why Paul lets it go so long, is because of the PR of it. She had a reputation. That word was getting out. You wouldn't believe what she said. But here is, here is very clearly a situation, back to this providence of God thing, that God in His power and His might is actually getting Satan to speak for Him. Oh yes! Clearly God's allowing her to do that. Clearly it is in recognition to when, when she is in the presence of Paul and Silas, even though it is an evil that is underneath what she's doing. All she can help but speak is the truth in God's presence. And it is, these men are servants of the Most High God and they're telling you the way for salvation. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And it could be. It could be. Right. But then God counters that with the positive. And what does he do? So right. overall, God's word has its always work. It is going to have to right. do hardship and heartache, but it always works. Yeah. God's yeah. Yeah. God's God's message always works. And no matter what you think you can do, God's going to one up you. <laughs> Big time. And yeah, and so here yeah, and, and like Mick said, we don't know the context. We don't know whether whether she is, you know, seemingly for them. I, I doubt it's completely that way. I, I, there, there likely is some mocking uh, effect in this. But, but even, even mockingly, the words are just gospel. You know, these men are from God, and they're teaching you how to be saved. 
Whether you say that mockingly or not, that's the truth. And that is a, a strong endorsement. So here you have, you have the demon doing this, and then Paul casts it out. So all of a sudden, you have the, the demon that can't help but speak the truth, and then Paul overpowers it, casts it out, and now this young lady is, is completely in her right mind and just like everybody else. And then um, the rest of the story, Paul and Silas get arrested because the owners of this young lady drag them out and, and have them arrested. And here is what they do. Um, they drag it in verse 19. And when our owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. When they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many Jews blows upon them, they threw them in the prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So here, they bring them before the people, said these men are Jews and they're trying to get us to do things that aren't, that aren't right for Romans to do. There is clearly, when you look at that, there is some, some racial hatred there. Um, we, we notice that probably more in, in these days. But, but these men are Jews. That's the, first, that's the first accusation against them. They're Jews. They can't be good. They're Jews. Second of all, they're trying to get us to do things that we shouldn't do. They're trying to get us to break the law. Well... How do you get that out of what they did? No way. Their, their accusations, well, they were Jews, but their accusations other than that are completely slanderous. No basis of truth to them. No, no, uh, nothing that you, can, uh, that you can point to as being correct. And so the crowd, uh, the mob mentality comes about, and they, they join in. And they tear the garments off of them. They beat them with rods. And they throw them in prison. And so that is uh, what they do. And uh, you have a very, very big mob scene. We know about when they're in the Philippian jail. It says in verse 25, About midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. I've seen a picture uh, before of the Philippian jail. And it is basically a little hole in the ground. It is a, it is a very small jail. Um, we would, we, uh, most of us that have basements have basements that are significantly larger than, uh, than the Philippian jail. If memory serves me correctly, it's like 20 by 20, something like that. It's just a, just a small little hole in the ground, the, the Philippian jail. And so when it says that they were singing and praying and the prisoners were listening to them, they couldn't help but listen to them because they were practically on top of each other. They weren't worried about personal space and all the other things that, that might be a, a, of interest today. But it was a tiny little jail, a tiny little place. And so they're all in there together. And they're listening. And, you know, here Paul and Silas have really gone through a rough day. And what got them into trouble? The truth? Doing good? You know, righteous actions? Speaking God's Word, yeah. All of those things were a part of what they did. 
So they were unjustly accused, and they were beaten, and we know a little later on, the next morning, that both Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. We already know Paul is, but Paul and Silas are Roman citizens. And so, they've got a really big ace in the hole <laughs> that they're going to use the next day. Because what they did was, you know, of course, Philippi being a you know, uh, place that has a lot of uh, Romans in it, it's a very large Roman colony. What they did was very, very illegal by beating them without a trial. And anybody that participated, under Roman law, if Paul and Silas won the present, everyone that had a part in doing what was done to Paul and Silas would have been culpable to have received the same punishment for having done that. That would have been a really big turn of the tables had they opted to exercise their right. They had a legal right to that even. So you talk about a really, they could have really done it. You know, I think if we were in that situation, that probably many, if not most, if not all of us, would have been plotting that political move the next morning. I could, I could see that. They're not doing that. They're not, they're not singing the hee-haw song. Remember the hee-haw song that they'd sing? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark, depression, excessive misery. Oh, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. I saw it a time or two. I'm a child of the 70s. Couldn't help but watch that. Every, night, every Saturday night was Hee Haw and Lawrence Welk. We got, that's how I got my West Virginia culture. Uh, that's how you got it too, wasn't it? You know, Hee Haw and then, and then Lawrence Welk. I mean, that was the culture part, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that's not what they're singing. They're not, not singing something depressing and discouraging. You know, I don't know what they were singing, but it's something that was affecting the the uh, the other inmates. They're singing this about midnight, and here comes an earthquake. In verse twenty-six, suddenly there was an earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners escaped. And generally, uh, jailers received the punishment that was to be given to those they were watching over. And if the whole jail got out at once, undoubtedly the, the punishment would have been death to that. And so he... He is going to try to take his own life to, uh, to avoid that. So he raises his sword to do that, and supposing they'd all escaped. But Paul cried in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved you and your household. A lot of people want to stop right there and say, well, right there, all you got to do is believe. But you will notice, they spoke the word of the God to him, to him and all those in his house. Do you notice? He says, believe. And then they spoke the word. So there was still, they, he said believe, but immediately they spoke the word to them and took them the same hour and washed their wounds, and he baptized, was baptized at once, he and his family. And they brought them up to his house and set food before them, and they rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. Now, there are other conversions and acts that are clear, like the Ethiopian eunuch, like those on Pentecost in Acts 2. But I want you to notice... 
He said believe. He, then he taught them further. And they were immediately baptized. You talk about a risk. Here he is taking two prisoners around the city in the middle of the night so that he and his family could be baptized. If it wasn't important, if it was not important, it had been real easy for Paul to say, I'll get with you in a day or two when we get out. And we'll baptize you. But they went in the middle of the night. Also, the rejoicing did not take, did not take place until after they were baptized. That's the progression. Well, that's true, and, and and that you know he, I, I believe he's talking about about spiritually, but but he may have there's a, a certainly a connotation or a context that could be talking about physically as well. Uh, he realizes that you know here he is, he's ready to take his own life, and he realizes the ramifications of that, and he recognizes you know you know he he apparently was asleep, but when the earthquake happened. But he probably heard Paul and Silas a while before he went to sleep and knew what they were about, knew why they were there, and he wanted to know what they had to say. And, yeah, he needed to be taught. And when he was taught the truth, when the Word was taught to them, they immediately, that very hour, went right out and and baptized him. And so it was significant. It was the, the thing they did. Only after... He baptized him and his family. They went back. And then they made some food. And then they they visited. And the rejoicing began. And what does it say? At at, the very end there in 34. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. At At the end of the night, they rejoiced that they had believed in God. But what have they done? Well... What's that? They acted on that belief. What was the, see, that's the whole question, though. What was the belief? You know, it's kind of a, it should be offensive to us as Christians that we allow those out in the world to say, oh, all you have to do is believe. Well, right. Are we so naive and stupid mm-hmm. to, to say, oh, okay, that sounds good. When Paul said this to the, the jailer, all you have to do is believe. Oh, yeah, okay, I believe. Right. I have to know more to be able to believe. Right. The believe in the believe in God, the belief that Paul stated, and then the rejoicing at the end because of the belief was the, the totality of it all. And as Mark said, it was also the obedience to that belief. It was the belief in Jesus, the belief about Jesus. And what he did because of that belief in Jesus, it was, it was only after the whole night's progression had taken place. You know, we don't know uh, exactly what all was preached, but in verse 32, as he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that is in the house. And whatever the word of the Lord was, it included the understanding that he, he and his family got and be baptized. Yeah, the word of God has to be present in order to be saved. It's just like the just like the, the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. It tells that he he got in there and he started talking to him about Jesus, and then it's a little while later that the Ethiopian eunuch says, Well, here's water, what keeps me from being baptized? And all the text had said was that he'd talk to him about Jesus. Where did the Ethiopian eunuch get the idea that he needed to be baptized unless talking about Jesus also included baptism somewhere in the story. And so it's basically that way here. You know, all it says was, you've got to believe, and he told him the Word of God, and the first reaction is, let's go out, and, and he and his family were baptized. That's the progression of the, the natural situation that, that came about. And it was only after that was all over that it says they rejoiced because they had believed. And, and Mick's exactly right. The belief is not just simply a, I believe in God. It is a totality of, he's come to the realization 
that Jesus died for him and he knows the story about Christ and, and he knows what he needed to do because of that and he's, he's a new person and because he went out and was baptized that night forgiven of his sins and, and the whole part of that that is, a, that is a totality of the whole of that, that night and that progression and so all of that comes about um, and it's not just simply a, a, a glib uh, belief why I believe well you know what that demon possessed girl believes you know the demon believes you know, James tells us that the demons believe and shudder. But what does she say? She makes a great confession. You could almost call that the great confession. These men are from God, servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you the way to salvation. That's a pretty strong endorsement. That's a pretty strong statement of faith. That's a stronger faith, statement of faith than many people will make believing it's, it's salvation. There's no indication in any way, shape, or form that she was even remotely a follower of Christ at that point because she's still demon-possessed. I don't believe at all at that point. Now, was she later? I think that there's at least a good idea that, that she may have came to faith. We're not told the rest of the story. But yeah, she absolutely believed, made that statement. Oh, it is. It is. In that, in that very text... Here is somebody that believed made a bold statement about who Paul and Silas were. She had more insight into an understanding of who Paul and Silas were than probably some that were even Christians. She was able to cut right to it and say, these men are servants of the Most High God and they're telling you the way to salvation. That's, that's spot on. He was reading from Isaiah. He didn't know what he was reading. Yeah, Isaiah 53. That's a great passage, but confusing if you don't know about Jesus. Certainly it does. Certainly it does. And, you know, uh, when, I, when I talk on that subject, if I was doing a sermon on that subject, um, I, would, I would go back to Acts 2. Because in Acts 2, early on in Peter's message, he says, everybody, he's quoting Joel. And when he quotes Joel, he says, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then later on, you come down to verse 36, 37, the people are cut to the heart and they say... To Peter, what shall we do? Peter could have said, I already told you, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's what he says to the men. And so, the only way you can reconcile that Peter's telling the truth all the way through, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And when they ask the point, blank question, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. What you'll recognize is that calling on the name of the Lord is repenting and be baptized. You also go over to Acts chapter 22. You have the conversion of Saul. When Saul is converted, that Ananias comes to him in Acts 22, 16 and says to him, does anybody remember what it says to him? Yeah, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on His name. You call on the name of the Lord. There are, there are three verbs in that sentence. Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Calling on His name. Calling on His name is an adverbial phrase that has to be connected with or describe a verb. That's the way it works. That's what an adverbial phrase does. It describes a verb. And so, calling on His name is gone to describe either arise, be baptized, or wash. 
standing up, that's what a rise is. I don't think anybody that reads that would equate standing up with calling on the name of the Lord. And then my point is, choose which one of the other two you want. <laughs> Be baptized or washed. Because those are essentially synonyms in the context. So, calling on the name of the Lord is being baptized or washed for your sins. It's that simple. So, you know, you have that. Anyway, and, you know, of course, you got many other passages. you got like Romans 6 about how that we die to sin, are buried with Him and raised to walk in newness of life. You don't get to walk in newness of life till you've died, been buried, and raised. I mean, that's what we all want, isn't it? The newness of life that eventually ends up being eternal life and that only comes after the progression of the other things. Anyway. Um, and so, some want to just yank that verse out of this context without looking at the whole context and realizing that the statement of belief is in the overall context of the whole story and that was that they immediately went out and were baptized. So, anyway. So don't let anybody just yank that out from you without looking at it. And also looking, it's a very good point, the same context, the same story, how they ended up in prison is because they cast a demon out of somebody that believed who clearly was not a follower of God. So, all right, we're going to spend another week on the second missionary journey because we haven't finished it yet. We should be able to finish it next week. Um, so if you want to read ahead, read Acts chapter 17 and 18. Those two chapters are going to get you ready for, uh, for this. And we wind out the, um, the second missionary journey with these two chapters. Chapter 17 is a fascinating one. It's where Paul is on Mars Hill in Athens and talks about the unknown God and the altar of the unknown God. Pretty cool stuff. We'll look at that next week.